no, thank you so much for inviting me, uh, Camille and, and Julius. Um, super happy to be here. Um, I want to talk about something unusual today that I've never talked about before. So cut me some slack. I just made the slides for this event. First time, a little nervous. Um, because I get bummed out about stuff. I read these terrible papers and I am part of a review process and sometimes things really bum me out and I lose my motivation and I sort of, you know, like things don't look that great sometimes. And I, I've long thought about how to, what to do with that. How, how do I deal with that? Because when you're bummed out, you might be a shitty mentor also, you might be less motivating for your students, right? We need to encourage younger people to join this and so on. And so I've been long thinking about this and then, I don't know, like half a year ago or so, maybe a little more, I sat down and wrote a blog post on the topic um, of cynicism creep, sort of the slow getting bummed out, maybe even burning out. Because some of the smartest, loveliest, best colleagues of mine are in that state. You can sort of tell, you know, some people on, on Twitter or, or Blue Sky, where you can just see they're sort of just grumpy. They, they have no hope anymore, right? And that's also not a good place to be in. And so in the blog post and the talk today, I want to talk about three things um, related to this topic. First, I want to talk about all the problems that I see and that I'm assuming you see also, um, right? That's things we're all aware of. There's terrible papers and reviews are problematic and so on. And the publishing industry, all, you know, there's going to be not that much new to you, I hope. Um, but I think I need to make the point to explain to you why I get bummed out. This leaves me in this position of cynicism creep, right? You you feel bad about yourself or your work or academia, you lose hope and sort of just disappear, burn out, you know, you're gone. And that's not a not a you know great place to be in. I think you know that's not what you want your career to be. And so I think I need to click on this. I have been thinking about these antidotes to cynicism creep, um, things that motivate me, that keep me going, that give me energy. And um, so maybe things aren't all that bad. Oh, you just got to find your thing and then, and then you know, uh, think about that. Okay, that's the talk. Uh, do ask questions and interrupt if you want. Uh, a little warning, I also do this in my blog, which I'd never done before. Uh, my mom is texting me, which I... Quiet. Um, my sister had a baby recently, so there's probably photos. Um, I do this in the blog as well. Um, this is a bit of a rough talk. If you leave after 20 minutes, you're going to be a little bummed out. So I recommend you. <laughs> it gets better, but first it gets worse. Right? So that's the situation. All right. Um, again, this is the blog. Um, I don't reference all the things I do and say in the talk, all the papers I refer to, but you can find them all as direct links in the blog. I didn't have the time to embed every single URL. Okay. So my position today is that most published papers do not add value. And I'm going to try to convince you that this is true. And I think this is a pretty strong opinion, but I really believe that at this point. Um, and I'm going to talk about a couple problems. First, there are so many conclusions in the literature that are not supported by evidence. I always say a good paper is one where the conclusions follow from the evidence. It can be in one single participant, as long as your conclusions are proportional to the evidence you present. I'm good with that. I think it's a good paper or good enough. That's how I review papers as well. Conclusions, evidence, good, fine. <clears throat> and then you have people citing these papers where the conclusions don't follow from the evidence. Um, I'm gonna use psychedelic science as an example today because we recently wrote a sort of review paper on the problems in the literature. Um, and then somebody just claims something in an abstract and then people in the future don't read the paper, they read the abstract and they cite the abstract for supporting evidence for something that never was there in the first place. Um, that's a bit how we got the big five actually in personality. Like you fit a couple factor models to some random data set, four, five, six, seven factors all fit equally well. Somebody says, oh, we found a five factor solution. A second group of authors does the same. They also take the five factor model because the first paper said it and they say we replicate the five factors, which they didn't. The four factor fits just as well. And then you sort of get this reification of something that was never there in the first place. Um, and then of course we get in the topics you all care about this. So that's why you're here today. It's not news to you. Most papers are unreproducible. Uh, I don't have the code. And often the statistics in the papers aren't clear enough described that I can actually reproduce. Are you using a student's t-test or sort of parametric t-test or support? I don't know. Often people don't say that. And 
All of you know about the reputability crisis. I don't need to repeat that. Um, so much is, isn't replicable. Um, somebody posted this two or three days ago on X, I think, saying like, hey, I recently looked at my 2005 textbook I bought as a student in social psych. None of the 12 chapters are there anymore. Like none of these 12 big things replicate. And 20 years isn't that much time for a science. Like, the stuff should you know, be robust. At least the main stuff that we teach students in textbooks, you would you would reckon. Um, told you this was gonna be a rough start. Um, and we've worked a lot on theories in the last uh, decade, Danny Borsbaum and Jonas Hasselbeck, Don Robino and so on. And if you look at theories in, in psychology, nearly all of them are verbal, they're narrative, they're vague. People say X leads to Y, but these theories are not falsifiable. They're also not verifiable. They're just narrative, rough, random descriptions that are open to interpretation. I'm not gonna go into this in too much detail today, but Paul Meal wrote famously that most theory and psychology are just go away when people lose interest. They aren't really actually, actually properly rejected because the theories aren't phrased in the way that we could actually test them. If I start testing other people's theories, what they will say is like, yeah, but that's not really what we meant because psychologists get away with this, of hidden moderators and stuff like this, because the theories aren't actually precisely described, for example, via equations or things like this. It's a really big problem for open science. I think. Still working on a paper on the top. So here's some, some papers on this. Many of those you will know. Um, the Uni United's paper, my most published research findings are false. I'm not sure I agree with most, but you know, a substantial part uh, is probably correct. Um, the 2015 uh, PSS paper, where they tried to replicate 100 social psych experiments, and I, I think we're able to replicate a third or so, depending on how you read that paper. Welcome. Um, then a lot of people sort of point fingers at social science or psychology, but we there is the same problems in, in cancer biology, by the way. So huge replicability issues across you know the bank, epidemiology and so forth. I haven't read this in a while, but I think something like 50 out of 54 core findings in nature and science didn't replicate. Animal studies, like really crucial uh, basic work on which the whole literature is based. Um, yeah, you might have seen this. 8% of researchers in, in Dutch uh, survey have falsified or fabricated data. Not correct, have admitted to falsifying or fabricating data. It's a bit of a difference, but, but still. Um, and this was anonymous, so the number's probably larger. You know, not everybody might admit that. Really big problem. Um, then, I mean, now we're getting sued for highlighting issues in papers. Um, so this is the Gino Harvard professor lawsuit who sued the Data Colada blog bloggers last year, who found problems in her data. <laughs> and uh, the lawsuit was actually um, decided, I think, last week, and, and uh, they were found innocent and they sort of that. And just sue scientists, but yeah, they they you know had to worry a lot, and I donated to their legal fund and stuff like this. That shouldn't happen in academia. That people get sued for <laughs> libel when you found uh, clear problems. Harvard also let her go, by the way, so she's definitely guilty. Um, and then I found this yesterday. Thank you, James, for ruining my beautifully organized slide. Look how, how nice it looked before this morning. I needed to add this, but James published this yesterday, new preprint, um, in which he looks at twelve papers which estimated the percentage of fake papers. So 12 studies, sorry. And I think I have that in my slide note somewhere, I don't know, maybe five, 10, 15,000 paper, individual papers were looked in, in this study. It's a bit of a meta-analysis. And James finds that uh, set, one in seven papers is fake. One in seven published papers in science is fake. So that's not great. Okay. Um, we've also had over 10,000 retractions last year, and I can tell you from my personal experience, it is basically impossible to get papers retracted. Like something needs to be so wrong with a paper to get retracted. So these are not just like bad papers. These are like egregiously bizarre, weird violations to get papers retracted. It's very, very, very hard. Um, I've been working on for two years now to get a paper retracted. That is a meta-analysis trying to understand if there's a relation between meditation practice and brain morphology. The authors find a relationship because they excluded all null findings from them. Like stuff like this, it, it, whatever. Um, okay, so uh, this is a problem. 
there's a cool uh, person on X, uh, author for sale, and they post examples. They look at forums and so forth and post examples, screenshots where people sell authorships um, on the internet. So for, I don't know, 300 US dollars, you can get a, a middle authorship on a paper on photo nanochemistry. Uh, um, pretty cool. Um, and then you can also just read papers. And most of you will have read papers and thought like, oh my God, um, I'm going to give you three examples. I, um, we wrote a recent review paper on psychedelic science, which is full of really bizarrely egregious problems. Um, people never believe this, so I always need to have concrete examples. I gave a talk on this recently, so the next two slides are from that talk, hence the different format. Um, these are all papers published in tier one medical psychiatry journals, impact factor 30 plus journals, you know. Um, so this is a paper um, of an open label ketamine study for suicidal aviation, meaning only one treatment arm. Uh, the authors found that two out of 14 people showed sustained improvement at three months. Three months was the exit of the trial. And the authors called the paper rapid and sustained reductions in suicidal ideation, which just isn't true. It is factually not true. It, you can read the title and the abstract, and you will see in the abstract already that the title is false. Um, and this stuff is everywhere. Um, and another study found no benefit of ketamine over placebo at their own predetermined exit time of six weeks. And they conclude that ketamine has persistent benefits uh, in the abstract. Again, it's just, I, 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 I can't show more egregious examples than those where the own conclusion is violated by the own results in the abstract. Like, I don't even know what to say. This is a study I could talk about forever. Uh, they have two groups, ayahuasca versus placebo. They say in the paper blindness was adequately preserved. Basically, it means like if you guys are in the ayahuasca group and you are in the placebo group, I ask you during the study, in which group do you think you are? Um, and obviously, people who take ayahuasca know they get ayahuasca. So this can be true at face value. Everybody who has ever taken ayahuasca or ever observed somebody from a far distance knows people know if they take ayahuasca, in part because they throb, for example, uh, like all of them. Um, so they claim blindness was preserved, but it's actually not like 100% uh, guessed correctly in one group and only 30% uh, in the other. We also, they also conclude that the study brings evidence supporting the safety of psychedelics. And four out of these 14 people have to, had to be hospitalized for over a week. In the, it says in the paper itself, you don't even need to dig anywhere. So a few examples. Uh, I talked about this already. Um, and I have a couple of blog posts. Um, on really problematic inferences. This is just from this year. Don't read them. It's really frustrating. Um, but I just wanted to make the point that there's problems. So, okay. Second point is peer review. Um, it's not going to stop for a while. I'm sorry. Um, okay, I have time. <laughs> so papers are problematic. I reading a paper for the first time when I don't know the authors, my Bayesian prior is this might be true but it might also not be true. And it doesn't matter if it's in nature or science or in a journal I don't know about. That's sort of my uh, perspective. And I think it's evidence-based. I think that's not a weird conspiracy theory perspective. I think that's a, that's a plausible take on science, which is really disheartening. Don't stop watching here. This is on YouTube. It gets better. <laughs> okay, peer review. So my parents are non-academics, right? And so sometimes I just think how they would see science and I talk to them about it. Uh, my parents were very surprised when I told them for 80% of my papers, I have to suggest reviewers. I can't even leave it empty. I must suggest my own reviewers. And obviously, that's very easy to game. That's, I mean, you don't need to be very smart to figure out how to game that system where you suggest friends. Like, um, I was recently invited to peer review my own paper by a really good journal also. <laughs> Um, so there's also no automatic checks and balances in place, apparently. Like, you know, you would think that any system should also, my name, like Ico, is not a name that so you know you should you should detect that problem in a system. It's not like I'm Michael or whatever, and there's a 500 Michaels, and then you know there can be a problem with that. So that's weird. Then there are big studies now where they looked at thousands and thousands of grant proposals, and grant proposals are better than papers because you are asked very specifically how to read the grant proposals. You have like six boxes and you're asked to look at the quality of the thing and then is it feasible? So in a way you expect integrated reliability to be higher for grants, for grant reviews, because, because there's like a, a leash basically, like a very clear guideline how to review. And uh, it's like basically zero 
like uh, for for grants for hundreds of thousands of, of grants there's multiple papers on this this is a smaller one and um, there's no proper scientific standards for peer review every journal has their own little thing i don't find the time to always read those instructions exactly for every journal if i do my five peer reviews that i try to do per month there is to my knowledge no basic quality checks there are of course great editors out there um i've worked with i don't know Lens in psychiatry, and I work there as a statistical reviewer. They even pay a little bit of money, which is really nothing if you com compare to consulting fees you get if you're an expert in IT or law or whatever. But you know, it's it's something. And the editors I work with there really care, and they also disqualify bad reviewers and so forth. It happens, but I've seen so many bad reviews that were just taken at face value by the editors um, in the process. Um, so one example, I get invited constantly to review geological geological papers because I work on depression and that's a term in geology like a de depression so there's not even a check of what field you work in by these systems um and of course I don't review those but I could um, my PhD students after you submit your first paper you're in the system you get automatically written if you want to peer review papers I'm not saying PhDs make bad reviewers um, uh, everybody gets their own thoughts on this. I think PhD students are actually pretty critical and, and careful and write longer reviews, which I think can be helpful. But I, I also think they have other things to do and, and maybe you need a bit more experience publishing your own work before you get to be enrolled in this process. So it's just an example that there's no quality control checks and balances. On average, again, some journals, bloody blah, blah. I'm sure some things are really great. Most things are not. Um, Yeah, I get peer review invites. It's Sunday night. I have a busy week coming up. It's a buddy of mine who asked me to review a paper. I might do it, but you know, I have two hours. It's you know, I I, I do it because I care about scientific integrity. That, I don't know. That's not great. If, if it's if you know, I, it's just not a great system. I think overall. Um, again, if you review papers commonly, you you constantly see bad reviews, like terrible reviews. I I often review clinical, not often, I regularly review like big fancy clinical trials that make like big headlines. Um, and either I recommend rejection, and that means the paper will just be published in another tier one journal without me reviewing it, it happens all the time. Or I recommend uh, bigger changes um, most of the time. It's a lot of work actually reviewing clinical trials because you need to check the statistical analysis plan and the pre-registration and they're very complex. You need to check if authors switched outcomes and stuff like this. And um, I often see other reviewers' comments for a paper I reviewed that read something like, I mark this paper is by Bob. We were together in Gamma Kappa Alpha 40 years ago. Uh, Bob works at a medical school. He has lots of papers. I like Bob's work. Like, I'm not even joking. This is not uncommon, unfortunately. And then the editor's like, great, let's uh, accept this paper as is. Um, again, it doesn't happen all the time, but it happens sufficiently often for me to be worried about it. Um, there's also no accountability for bad reviews. I promise you, if you do the next 10 reviews and you just write, fuck you, <laughs> nothing will happen. There's no consequences. One in 10 journals might not invite you back, but like nobody, it's not like anything, there's no accountability at all. I, I've signed my reviews for eight years. Um, so I think I'm accountable, right? I hold myself accountable in a way. I, I, I've written my reviews very differently since I signed them, I admit, right? Um, Got to be put more work into it and so on. Um, it's a different topic, but anyway, no accountability. So in summary, peer review isn't, yeah, go ahead. Yes, so um, I'm a big fan of open peer review, but I'm not necessarily a big fan of must sign your peer review. So journals like BMC, for example, always publish all the reviews, which is super helpful because journalists can actually look if a review just reads, I like Mark, Mark does great work, right? Um, we have a situation right now where yesterday Nature Human Behavior retracted a paper, and uh, you can look at the reviews. And in fact, uh, so I haven't double checked this, I just read this today. Uh, 
um, there was a commentary on the paper or sort of a critical piece about the paper. And then the editors decided to retract the paper. But some people today claim that they looked at the reviews and that these comments were, most of them were actually raised in the review process already. So it's kind of weird that the editors like sort of let the paper through, but now retract it based on supposedly the same arguments. So I think reviews should be public, but I don't think all PhD students need to send their reviews, for example, because you guys are vulnerable to some degree and, you know, there might be retribution things. It's a difficult debate. Um, so pro openness, but not necessarily pro signing. I think people like I should be forced to sign reviews because I'm a white German do dude who can really afford with tenure. I can really afford, you know, that basically. Sorry. Yeah, I think people higher in the hierarchy should be signing their reviews. I think there should be, uh, I can afford to be accountable for what I do. Yes. <laughs> White, white German male people should not make suggestions on this. No, no, seriously, because of course there are, you know, women of color in the US who pays much more shit than I do as a tenure, even if they have the same career stage as I do. So it's a complicated debate, but I think the, the more senior you are, the more likely you should be. The, yeah. Yep, I agree. Absolutely. So the uh, for people listening to this online, maybe they don't they don't hear you. Just to repeat this, uh, you suggested that um, it's a nice learning experience for PhD students. I fully agree. Have your supervisor go over it with you, maybe, and then you know let, let them show you how to write a peer review, review report and so on. I think it's a good idea. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, perhaps make make your supervisor sign. Um, and so my my my, concept, my my conclusion here is that peer review has sort of become a criterion for selling papers rather than a, a quality safeguard, right? Journals sell papers. Papers are marketable more if you say they're peer reviewed, but that doesn't really mean that much anymore, being peer reviewed. Um, there's a really fantastic piece by, by Adam Mastroianni. I never know how to pronounce the name. He also like has a like, 20 minute sound like he talked like you can podcast it basically he talks through the blog post or he sort of recorded it and um, and he says has it's it's failed like there's really no evidence peer review actually works and we should abandon peer review and i'm not going to get into this today i just wanted to show you things are not great publishing industry yay um so as you know, Elsevier, Springer, and so forth are businesses like Apple, Amazon, Google. They make money by selling products. That's working as intended. I don't mind that, right? We have businesses. I guess that's okay. They have ridiculous profit margins. Elsevier had like 38 or something, 38% profit margin, 2023. That's ridiculous compared to other successful companies. Um, well, why is that? Because you guys work for free for Elsevier. You, you review their papers, you work as an editor, right? All of them, they don't pay their workforce. They pay some people, but the majority of the work is done by us for free. So of course they have profit margins. Um, in the so yeah. Um, and of course there's no inherent tr interest in truth or scientific integrity. These are companies. I, again, that's okay. I don't think Google needs to have an inherent interest in scientific integrity or Elsevier. They're for profit companies, they have, they have on the stock market and stuff like this, we are the idiots who made them, who put them in power to be responsible for scientific integrity. It's not there, it's just a company, right? So I think it's uh, capitalism working as intended and it's our fault that we gave all the journals away to these companies when universities or governments or the UN or whatever could easily run these journals just as much, uh, charging much less, you know? Um, I mean, this is just one page on Elsevier. I really highly, rec highly recommend the Wikipedia, just so you know what these companies do. So Elsevier has sponsored article compilations um, on behalf of pharmaceutical companies that were made to look like journals, but they weren't actually journals. Like they just made fake journals. Um, this is all like they were all sued for this and had to pay in court. So this is not something I allege. Um, they offered Amazon vouchers for uh, researchers to submit five-star reviews on certain Amazon products like Elsevier books and things like this. They were caught manipulating citation reports, and they also employ full-time lobbyists in the European Parliament against open open science policies. Um, we have a blog post on this in a bit more detail where we try to get our own data deleted from Elsevier, which turns out to be very difficult. Um, 
uh, yeah, MDPI publisher published on average two special issues per day last year. Um, you can imagine that not all of these are really quality publications. Um, we've had many papers retracted more and more. Um, and then a big drama last year, universities often use Scopus rankings to see like which are the cool researchers in a unit that get like a bouquet of flowers because they published like in the best journals. And in the Scopus ranking in philosophy, three of the 10 journals were fake journals. So it's very easy to game this. I mean, so yeah, don't believe in these ratings and stuff like this because it turns out like, and there's more than 10 philosophy journals, obviously, right? So three made it in the top 10, top like 0.1% who weren't real journals. Um, yeah, I'll skip this. There's more stuff on this. Uh, actually, Retraction Watch has regularly very horrifying stories on how this stuff works. Um, Okay, so now you get to have me, a privileged white guy, complaining about my own life history. I'm sorry. But I mean, even I had it hard, is what I'm trying to say here. Uh, I did my PhD in Berlin. I got 1150 euros a month as a stipend. Um, I was not employed, so I need to pay my own health insurance. That's 300 euros. Um, uh, for a German university sort of keep you as a freelancer when you do a PhD. Um, which is illegal in any other industry uh, in universities get to do that because they don't, don't have to pay your your um, healthcare costs and stuff like this you're not formally employed and so yeah living from 800 bucks a month is possible but not super easy of course um and uh, they also don't pay into your um retirement fund and things like this right and so it's it's not optimal um other people have it much harder than i have um you know, about publisher perish, long work hours, mental health problems, like a permanent positions and things like this, right? I'm still in the part where I bum you guys out. I, we're gonna move past this in a second. And uh, there was an OECD report 2023 concluding that academic careers have become increasingly precarious, endangering rights, subjecting workers to difficult working conditions and stress, and so on and so on and so on. So things don't look great. Uh, these are three papers on mental health problems and, and, and rates in postdocs and so forth. And uh, this is Anna van Tver, the uh, founder of the Open Science Community in Leiden and sort of my, my open science role model. She's like the best person ever. You get to work with Anna Duso. I highly recommend uh, that. And she made this figure for a workshop we were teaching on um, uh, proper scientific practices, responsible scholarship, as we call it. And she makes the important point that to have a career in academia, most people work for their careers. They don't work for science. It's such a big problem. We should, like, that's not our job. We're not employed by taxpayers to work on our CVs. We're employed by taxpayers to work on figuring shit out. It's a real problem. Um, now, I there's a blog post by Talia Coney called It's Not the Incentives, It's You or something like this which I highly recommend as a counter perspective, who says, well, it might be like this, it's still your fault. <laughs> like you're still responsible. I'm not gonna cut you any slack for this. It's a really thorough blog post. I recommend that too. Gives a bit of a different perspective. I'm not gonna call the shots on like who's at fault, but this is a problem if we work for our CVs, right? Um, rather than for doing the things we're actually hired to do, which is not writing papers. It's like doing like the content of the paper, right? advancing science um okay so i see a paper i think hmm, probably not like it could be true but most likely I, I i really don't know um so my prior that the conclusion is inaccurate is larger than my prior that the conclusion of a paper of any given paper is accurate of course sometimes there's moderating factors of course sometimes i see an author on the paper and i know like hey susan really freaking cares like i know like she would not be willing to do anything or say anything that isn't corroborated 12 times. And I know she did all the robustness analysis. And I also know that she be registered. Like, of course that happens, right? That I that I trust some papers more than others because I know an editor looked over it who I just know to be a really thorough person or um but anyway, and I argue this is not a crazy prior to have, but it's a really problematic prior to have. It's not something that makes me very happy in my career, right? If every single paper you see you need to read, if every Guardian article, I need to find the original paper and see if, if that's actually what the paper says and, uh, okay. So this is, leads to what I call cynicism creep. 
just makes you demotivated, it makes you bummed out, it leads to actual burnout perhaps, it can be contagious, right? It's terrible for my lab if I come in the at work to my students and like, hey, let's read this paper today. It's probably fit, like, uh, you know, probably not true what they say and stuff like this. Let's find the flaws in the paper. It's not really fun. And and that's not a nice position. In, and so I wanted to sort of fix that and, and, and think through like how, what gives me energy because I'm not that bummed out. I, I maintain my, my level at a level that I'm happy with and I'm excited and I hope my students feel that as well. And so, um, yeah, this is what we don't want basically. And, or this, um, I guess this is sometimes how I feel. Um, okay. So, alternative take. What motivates me? How do I do it? You can see the problems I talked about now, and and, and many more problems as sort of a problematic status quo that threatens building a robust cumulative pyramid of foundational blocks that stand the test of time. Right? That's it's in the way of actually science. It doesn't mean we can't do any science. People have, my dad was cured of leukemia because awesome people worked on cancer biology and other things. And that, that doesn't not come from nothing. It's not like there's no progress, but we could do so much more and so much better. And um, it, it also threatens the public's trust, of course. All these big discussions are picked up by the media and they're picked up by, by people. And then all of a sudden we don't believe in vaccines anymore. It's, we're, we're in part responsible. These problems are in part responsible for the public's less than, uh, uh, lack in science, lack in trust in science. You can see there's a sense of urgency and call to action. It can be motivating to see these problems and say, hey, I'm going to do that better. We can fix that. And that's why you guys are here today, which I really appreciate, right? That's where reproducibilities and riot clubs and all these other grassroots organizations are for. You can do better as a community. That's really nice. For me, that gives me energy. Sometimes people should talk open science communities or open science, whatever, because there's a couple of jerks, right, in every community. Uh, sometimes people shit talk open science or whatever on, on X or, or, and I get really upset because I think about you guys as the open science people. It's mostly, it's like 95% early career people who really greatly care, who donate private time, who spend time on it. And that's why I get upset when people shit talk the communities because like one or two jerks don't make a community, right? So. Please keep going and then, you know, do your thing. You have our support. Um, so anyway, this is where my motivation and energy comes from. And now I want to sort of start a conversation about two types of antidotes. And I'm really curious to hear how you think about this and what, what motivates you. You have busy days. You have elsewhere to be. You came here anyway. And I want to talk about watching and doing. So sometimes I watch things, I witness things, and they give me energy. And then sometimes I can do things and they give me energy. I want to talk about this here first. Watching, what things do you do you guys see that give you energy, that give you hope, that motivate you to do your own science better? Hi, Baldy. <laughs> Recently, came across a paper that shows that uh, instead of Right. And I recently came across a paper that found that about now through being I don't know if boundaries were. Yep. But I thought, hey, there's there's change from that paper to now. Yep. So that um, gave me a lot of energy. That's really nice. Yeah. So I think I saw a paper, I, I might butcher this, but I think the Simin Vazir was on the paper. And I think they might have compared typical psych papers with pre-registered psych papers, and they show that the amount of confirmed null hypothesis or you know, null findings is much larger when papers are pre-registered or might have even be registered reports. And I think it was actually a couple hundred papers they, they interrogated. So that's really nice to see that these practices, at least in part, seem to change conclusions. That's nice to see. I agree. Thanks for that one. models that yeah you guys have open science role models and you i don't know how famous community members are like you might know anna for example anna van Tver, who's really fantastic yeah ej like, uh, yep uh, ej's lab ej wachenmacher in the in the uva um, in methods group done really cool work over the years. 
also the program jazz for example just really available and like a lot better than spss and you, you know don't pay anything for it it's really cool that's an open science thing too if you build a free software that for psychologists to use you know okay anything else that you've seen yeah i think along the same the R packages and application Right. Yep. Okay. Agree. So you're just for the online audience or people watching this later, sort of art packages, documentation, forums, uh, so many people donating their time. Yeah, I've, I put things on Stack Exchange, I think it was called, like 2011 during my PhD, and I you know, got tons of answers. And then I started, I joined the R mailing list at some point, but there were very few psychologists. So whenever I asked a question, they were like, give us a reproducible example it's like i don't know how to do that i i, I um and uh now i do the same on, in our facebook group I'm like just well i need to see your code i can't help you otherwise but anyway uh and so there's all these communities like the lavan for example lavan google groups they're like super nice people uh super helpful people um amazing to see people donating so much time into documenting their free software right that they spend time on and so please sign the software if you can um yeah okay I'll, uh, anything else Otherwise, I'll tell you what gives me energy in terms of watching. It's the time. I think we're good. Um, yeah, so there's super amazing scholars, role models. I have them too. Um, so many people I look up to. Um, I see all these grassroots movements and communities, and they give me so much energy. Genuinely, like genuinely seeing these talks, right, and others, and the reproducibilities, young people getting together, not, not young, early career people getting together, it might also be older people, of course. Um, I think that's amazing. We need both bottom-up and top-down reforms. And uh, yeah, top-down, yeah. I have a bit more influence than you perhaps at this moment, but um, I think we all need to play our part to sort of move the reforms in both directions. Um, yeah. There's also some things that actually go better, like the UVA has removed the tenure track. Sorry, the, the uh, Free University in Amsterdam has removed the tenure track. You know, uh, all my friends, uh, all my friends who don't work in academia don't get the tenure idea because they get permanent jobs when they're hired. Like who get who doesn't get a permanent? Like it's very common that you work somewhere and you just get a job. Like you don't get a job for eighteen months or for five years. My first UD position was for eight for five years. Who gets five year contracts these days in any other industries or whatever? If you're hired as a programmer, you don't have a five-year contract, you have a contract. And so the EBA does the same now, uh, the uh, free university, sorry, they removed the tenure track and uh, you get a, uh, after 18 months, you get a permanent job. And there's sort of a longer testing time. And yes, this has disadvantages, they might be able to hire fewer people and so on, but I think it's, there, there are, there is progress. And actually the Netherlands is one of the better places to be when it comes to that, to be, to be fair. Um, there's fantastic rewards and recognition initiatives at the, at, for example, Utrecht, I think, has one of the most extensive um, things. Uh, once a year, I get interviewed by my chair and they ask me like, hey, how many papers did you write and how many YouTube videos did you give? And, and did you talk to, you know, to how many journalists did you talk? Like sort of the classical sort of output stuff. And um, my chair does it really well, despite the form being like very impact factor heavy, if you know what I mean. And so uh, Utrecht and, and also Leiden now and many other universities are changing this a little bit. Like, what are we evaluating people? Did you help your colleagues on the floor? Did you co-author? Did you do statistical analysis for your friends? Like, you know, did you do service to the statistical community? Did you help our department? Or did you just like write first author papers and, you know, ignore everyone else? Like, there, there's so much to do here. Um, many of us have 60 or 80% teaching contracts, but we're evaluated on how many papers we write. That's actually insane, right? <laughs> so yeah, these people should be evaluated on the, on the teaching they do and, and, and things like this, right? So things are changing for the better. That makes, that gives me, um, yeah. there's really cool initiatives. There's error bounties. Um, so I have this in my blog post, I link to three researchers who have error bounties on their website. They pay you 50 bucks or hundred bucks if you find a mistake in their paper. How awesome is that? Like actually encouraging people to find errors. I had somebody write me 2017 uh, because I had done a matrix algebra error, like really in hindsight, like I, I'm ashamed, like a really stupid error in R. And uh, I could correct my paper because I had shared my code. They checked my code and they were like, hey, um, I, I didn't pay them back then. Um, 
but yeah, it leads to the correction of my work. That's awesome. That's exactly how science should work, right? Uh, you're you're fine. You're going to make mistakes. All of us do. If you're upset by somebody finding a mistake in your, I mean, of course, it's not a great day for me either, right? I'm not going to pretend this was like my best day. I was pretty bummed out, but like, you know, a couple of years later, that's great. That's fantastic. Somebody corrected my work. And if you get upset when somebody finds a mistake, if you get upset about them, what kind of perspective have you on your own abilities that you can never make a mistake? Like, you know, get upset with yourself. That's okay, but not with other people. Doing, what are you guys doing that gives you energy? It can be small things too. Talk about writing app art packages, yeah. Yeah, attending this, yeah, cool. Um, and we have open science cafes or lunches in, in uh, Leiden. I also try to go as much as I can. It's always really inspiring to see people who care. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah, so reproducible code. It honestly putting your code online will also force you to document your code better, really. And you know who is the person who will need to read your code in five years? You. <laughs> you will help yourself a lot, honestly. Um, I, I have, uh, yeah, I've been in this position many, many times. If you write papers and they become a little bit more popular, you get regular emails asking for stuff. So you can avoid a lot of communication if you uh, do that properly the first time. I was lucky that I had really good mentors and people I could just copy from, like how do you document code and so on. Um, yeah, anything else that comes to mind? I think it's also my already like reading. I noticed about myself that I also start reading papers differently in a way. Okay, there might be something here going on that's a bit maybe not really well done, or mm -hmm. that's some issue that I could find okay, this could have been done better, and also discussing this with others. Right, you're saying so you're saying that your involvement with the community has given you sort of the ability or the levers to identify problems more easily and yeah. then also discuss this with other people. And that's then also inspiring because I can be also able to recognize some of these issues that are yeah. around. Nice. I'm on it for my own research then. Yeah, it gets worse every year. I'm I'm glad you find it inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Anything else that comes to mind? Yeah, collaborate. Yeah, so code checking, for example, right? It involves somebody. Most of our papers have five, 10, 15 authors anyway. Why not add a 16th person who is independent from your lab in the best case, right? Who has no motivation to say yes or no, who just are going to thoroughly check your code. Put, put in a credit statement at the end of your paper, you know, and tell the audience who will read your paper, hey, Bob, check my code. He didn't do anything else. It wasn't his idea. He didn't do the whatever. He checked the code, and we think it's really valuable for Bob to check the code. He, hence, he's an author, right? And in the best case, at some point, Google Scholar will tell us for which paper we did what. And then if I want to hire a programmer and I see that Bob, for eight of his 10 papers, checked code, awesome, you know? And so I think we can do a lot more there with quite little effort. Um, and indeed, so we're trying to do this in Leiden. Now it's not easy because it takes actually a while to code. So I have code checkers, but then they're also responsible for that. And that's a big burden to carry, of course, if you're responsible for like a big machine learning pipeline project, right? That's a that's not a job you can done in two in a week. Uh, you know, when my, my postdoc wrote code over half a year, <laughs> even if it's clean, that's work to do. And so we try to do that for the grad students now in Leiden, also in my group, um, uh, not in, in the unit I work in clinical psych unit so that they sort of make like co-checking bodies or something, which is a nice first step. Um, just after that, we will actually have a talk in March by Edward Klabike, who's working on a project like this of making code checks more available. Okay, follow the riot Rotterdam on X. <laughs> you can see awesome talks there. Okay, so what gives me energy? Activism, join the communities you can, uh, you know, uh, and, and sometimes you can't attend, that's cool. I mean, nobody expects everything. But I don't know. These meetings give me energy. I'm, I'm super glad to be here. Um, I don't tend to travel for talks too much anymore. Uh, so, I'm, uh, but, but I really wanted to do this. Um, thanks for the invite because it gives me energy to see you here. Um,
So this is Anna and me teaching a workshop on responsible scholarship and collaborating with Anna a lot on these topics. We're also writing this up as a paper. We toured the psychology units, talking to them a little bit about yeah, mostly open science practices, really, but we think of it as sort of responsible uh, practice. Um, this is on and me on the boat ride because you know if you make friends, then you, they they also are friends outside of work or outside of the open science community. Uh, sadly, I didn't take a selfie with both of us, but we're in the same boat. Uh, um, this is the Young Academy Leider, which I joined a couple of years ago. Uh, not so young anymore, but sort of uh, uh, the Young Academies in in the Netherlands are. Um, trying to be representatives of like early career scholars past the PhD level because you guys have reasonable representation usually in committees but sort of UDs don't actually have that and so it's been so motivating to see these people all care about politics they uh, they care about the environment they call about they care about hiring practices it's normalizing to be surrounded by people who care about the same kind of activism you do it's really nice um, now, I, I also get to incentivize and champion and promote better practices at my career stage. It's really nice, right? I can retweet things and so on. Um, I can highlight cool papers. Um, so it's not just like your own writing. You can also, you know, share cool work. You can send emails and say, hey, I love this. Thank you for doing that. Like, um, I get a lot of emails, but I rarely get emails saying like, hey, I watched your talk. I really liked it. Or, hey, thank you for this art package. It's so meaningful to people like, like, I mean, you write those emails. It's really, don't write them to me, but, you know, uh, please. Um, it really means something. There's a guy called Woodward, like a pretty famous philosopher. And I read a paper of his and it was like the best paper ever. I wrote him and he wrote back like two minutes later, like, I've never gotten an email like this. Thank you so much. <laughs> like, it's so nice. Um, and it's also motivating that students are really open to learn these issues. Like they're skeptical. Like I sometimes see these stupid arguments that you know people wouldn't understand it or whatever. You guys all want to learn. You want to be better scientists. You, you're critical. You want to write. You want to write proper code, and you want to draw conclusions that are proportional to the evidence. It's just not always easy. So you just gotta learn how to do that. But it really motivates me to see that my students are really eager to learn these things, and they care about good science more than some of my colleagues. <laughs> Um, yeah. And then I wanted to talk about organized skepticism a little bit. Who knows the Mertonian norms? Okay, Merton was a sociologist. He <laughs> invented four norms that he called the Mertonian <laughs> norms. <laughs> but it was the 50s and you called things after your own name, I guess. Um, and I like those. And one of these norms is organized skepticism. The idea that scientific claims should be exposed to critical scrutiny. And it, obviously you all agree with this, but I think it has been forgotten sometimes that it, like it's our job to call out conclusions that seem inappropriate. Like it's literally, you get taxpayer money for this. It's expected for me to do that, right? It's expected if it, I'm not expecting for me to get in trouble. And of course, people at more senior career stages are expected to do more in this, no question, but it's literally part of my job. And I find it bizarre if people mind you calling out stuff that is problematic. Um, you can do this by practicing to criticize, which is not easy. These are what, what are called Rappaport's rules. If you Google them, uh, you will find those. These are just direct quotes. Um, I'm not going to go through them, but if you ever want to write a critical commentary, I highly recommend you to Google Rappaport's rules and see if you can do that. It's actually very hard to criticize fairly and objectively and clearly. And part of that is to re-express the target's position so clearly that they would agree with your re-expression and only then get, do you get to criticize, which is really hard because you're not setting up a straw man, you're actually trying to express their opinion. Not gonna get into this, but think about that. And if you criticize, think about Rappaport's rules. Practice being criticized. It is so hard to separate yourself from your science. It feels so weird in the beginning when your science gets criticized because you think you're getting criticized, but it's not the case. It's just your paper. It's not you. It's a separate thing. It, it takes a lot of time in psychology. I sometimes think it's easier in physics, for example, because I can write an equation and I can put it online. And I wrote the equation, but it's not the ICO equation. It's an equation. But in psychology, because theories are verbal and narrative and vague, people who want to test my theory need me at the table. They don't actually know my theory because I haven't spelled it out in a way. So I'm like inherently tied up with my theory. And that's why people feel attacked when their theory gets criticized. Those are my very short summary of the problem. 
um, write about problems you see, people care. I have a career of writing about problems, and this is my most highly cited work. People really, really care about stuff. Uh, uh, Bootnet is an R package I, uh, that Sasha Epscom and I worked on, which sort of checks the robustness of network models. Because when I started my work in Amsterdam with Danny, I was like, I don't think these models are very robust, Danny. And he was like, oh, really? And then we bought an R package to test that, and we wrote a tutorial paper. And it has like 3,000 citations now. People really care. They all do that now. It's really, really nice. Um, people are willing to pick up this stuff. And we wrote this measurement measurement paper with Jessica Flake, highlighting issues with all the measurement practices, and people really read that paper. It's really nice. Um, yeah, and so forth and so forth. And then, yes, I'm not going to go into this, which, of course, you all know about register reports and things like this. I don't didn't want to like run through the things that are really known among young people anyway. But you can do a lot to improve your transparency. We try to do that in the lab. And I also try to get pushed by my own students on this stuff. I hate GitHub. I think it's super complicated to use, but my lab decided they're going to use GitHub because it's better than OSF for code and stuff like this. And so, you know, also find people who push you a little bit. <laughs> um, so the first part of, of the talk is getting disillusioned, but I, are we done? You, are you not? Oh, I'm at one more minute. The first talk was about being disillusioned, but I really want to highlight how that's a good word. Like if you separate those, it means you lose an illusion, right? Science isn't great. We got to accept that first before we can move on. If we all think peer review is perfect, then there's not going to be any change, right? Things are pretty shitty sometimes. We got to accept that, I think, and then we can move on and fix stuff. Um, it's like a fever or a cough, just sort of they're fine. They're just, you know, they're painful. There's real progress. So this is a recent UNESCO recommendation of open science. People are picking this up. A lot of things are happening. I'm 42. I finished my PhD 2014, 10 years ago. In the last 10 years, more has happened than in the last 100 years before in terms of open science transparency, new reforms, new methods and reports and data sharing. There's been real freaking huge progress. It's by far not enough, but it's really nice to see. And uh, yeah, I want to thank uh, people, especially early career people who are bold and speak up when they see stuff happening. Uh, and you know, if you have trouble speaking up, you can always contact people like me and then I can speak up on your behalf as well. Uh, not for you, you can speak up yourself, but if there's a big drama case and you don't feel comfortable speaking up against like super famous people, yeah, let us know. We can do that with you or for you. Thanks. Yeah, so I questions, comments, pushback. Nice yeah, it's a super good question. So the question was what the alternative to peer review is, and it's very hard. I think the first thing is sort of just accepting the status quo as what it is. And I often see people defending, like, I like writing blog posts, and then people say, yeah, it's not peer reviewed. I go, well, it is. There's like 30 commentaries on that blog post, and people have looked around and have written something about it, right? Why is that worse than peer review in a paper? So I, I I, so I think first we need to face the fact that that just because a paper is peer reviewed doesn't it's not really a ground for quality. I think. Um, again, it depends. Some journals do a pretty proper job. They have they employ statistical reviewers, right? That's better, but most journals don't. Um, the Mastriano blog post has a couple of solutions. I'm not committed to any of those. I don't mind post publication review actually. Um, so there's a world that some people in open science community imagine where all of us submit preprints somewhere to a central, like run by the European, whatever, you know, no journal. And then journals become places that collect cool papers. And basically they write you like, hey, we would like to publish your paper on this topic. We think it would fit in our journal. We are like in like a museum, like a, there's a, a collector or like some sort of editor and he, they they put things together. They shape it. That's a cool job. That, that's a that's a that's also a service to the community. Putting ten papers together that fit, and then um, this preprint server could come with post publication review, for example, right? And then it's difficult because people are trolls, and you know some people are assholes, and so on. And you would need to think this through in some way. How do you want to upvote reviews or not? And then you know fancy people could easily mobilize people to review their paper. Well, like every system has problems and, and can be abused. That's why I'm not committed to that, but there are opportunities, I think, to, to 
I have reviewed so many papers three or four times because they get rejected and are submitted to the next journal and the authors recommend me again as a reviewer. It is such a ginormous waste of reviewer time that I that papers get rejected five times and then like there's like 15 reviewers in the end who all said, no, this paper shouldn't be published. <laughs> right? It takes time. It's really stupid that these peer reviews aren't centralized and published if they are have some sort of quality standard, which is hard to determine, but we would need to figure this out. Yeah, some of us are a little burned, right? Some of us had papers rejected because of like really truly stupid peer review, and then we don't want the next editor to see it. But I've also had a case not that long ago where I had a terrible review and a good review, or like a high quality review, I want to say. And the editor rejected the paper, and I actually submitted the paper to another journal with the two reviews and my responses to the reviews and said, you know, look, I think this first reviewer was really, a, like he didn't get the paper. I think it was a stupid points he raised, so we didn't do anything for these and these reasons. Use the other review. We actually addressed all the concerns uh, and the paper was actually accepted as is upon submission, which very rarely happens because the editor said, you know what, that's convincing. So, so you can also do that, of course you can. Do that. So I, I work as editor for Collabra Psychology and there's a fast track, uh, which specifically does exactly this. If your paper got rejected for stupid reasons, because it's not high impact enough or whatever, like sort of these weird procedural reasons rather than scientific reasons, you can submit your paper to Collabra in this fast track with all the previous reviews and then the editor can actually just accept your paper if you did it now, which I think is, is, is a nice way to not waste. It's so much, I mean, such a societal burden having people like us not do their day job, but review papers over and over and over again. Yeah. Should elaborate a little bit about the yeah, um, I'm not an expert on fake journals. Um, I, I haven't been able to read James' preprint yet, but um, uh, there is a huge business around selling. Uh, so I make a website, it looks like a journal. I give it a name. I might even get like a, a DUI signifier, or I might even get an ISSN number or something that, that legitimizes me as a journal. I might not be uh, in, in Scopus or, or somewhere, or I might be in Scopus that we've seen. And then I just tell, I, I just tell you, hey, for 2000 bucks, you can have a paper in, in my journal. I'm not gonna review it. I mean, I'm gonna review it, but whatever. Right? And so the, the there's like a gradient between like a proper journal and a predatory journal. And there's a lot of stuff in the middle, like Frontiers is often considered predatory these days, MDPI journals. Um, uh, and yeah, that's, that's a business model. They just sell the name, of a journal and then you get you pay and it's not that different from open from an open access fee right mm -hmm. and for them they have no like because publishing costs no money if they charge you two thousand euros per paper that's a very profitable thing for them because they have no they, they maintain a website boo i maintain a website that's 30 bucks a year that's all they need to do i think that to wrap up yeah the german and me is also getting antsy yeah. and time is over uh, thank you so much for joining uh, <laughs>